Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm uh, on the National Advisory Committee on COVID uh, in Israel and uh, turned positive uh, just four days ago. <laughs> so uh, nobody is actually immune, uh, even though I'm vaccinated, of course, uh, three doses. Um, at least I got it with my wife. Uh, she's a law professor, so we can spend more time now together <laughs> in isolation. Um, by the way, I'm now also sitting on the advisory committee on the polio. We have a, a circulating vaccine-derived polio now in Israel. Uh, it's a big issue uh, only because of Ukraine and the pandemic fatigue. You probably, some of you miss it, but uh, uh, it's very tricky. Those who remember what happened in Israel in 2013-14, uh, this is even more complicated, but it's not our topic today, although it's a bit uh, related. Uh, I join you for part of the day. I heard also Professor Collins. Uh, unfortunately, then I needed to be in some uh, meetings and the uh, PhD exam. Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, it's a fascinating topic, and I want to thank, uh, of course, Ute and Sophie and, and all, all those who are involved. Um, I'm always uh, love to be in the center uh, events. Uh, it's very refreshing. Um, I have a degree also in uh, history and philosophy of science. Uh, so uh, having the option to have such a, a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary dialogue is, uh, is extremely uh, important and I'm very proud that it's taking place at Ben Gurion uh, University. Um, so um, let me know if you see my presentation. Okay. I just moved to the beginning of it. Yeah. Uh, okay, is it now full uh, screen? No. Yes. 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 Oh. Okay, thank you. So of course, uh, it, it's a bit uh, to <laughs> maybe even the hybris of uh, going from smallpox to COVID-19. Uh, now maybe even polio. Um, but um, uh, I uh, many times share this frustration that, uh, um, especially within the medical world, you know, we are very preoccupied with evidence-based uh, medicine. Um, there was some discussion about uh, meta-analysis and, and so forth. Uh, and for someone who is uh, within the public health uh, profession uh, more than two decades, uh, many times the uh, issue of public health research and the uh, public health research ethics uh, is not uh, getting the similar attention comparing to clinical and uh, biomedical uh, uh, scientific research. And uh, also I think uh, the discussion about causation uh, within public health um, is something that is very different. Um, so I'll bring you today some of my reflection that are both historical and sociological, also epistemological, actually. And I hope this will be uh, relevant for the overall uh, discussion. Uh, but before starting this, I'm always bringing this uh, uh, slide because uh, I always like to start with uh, values uh, when uh, we're doing uh, this kind of analysis. Uh, this is from 1892. Uh, it's uh, the trendy pandemic was cholera, not uh, not influenza, and of course, not yet COVID. Um, and actually, cholera is important. If you remember, Robert Koch uh, is a very important figure, and there is a Koch postulate that I'm not going to mention today, but uh, um, interesting from the perspective of causation uh, in... Um, uh, biological and bacteriological studies. <laughs> uh, but actually I brought this uh, slide. Uh, it's a caricature from uh, a judge, uh, 1892. You see they come arm in arm. Uh, this is asiatic cholera, uh, death. Uh, and you can see here, Uncle Sam, it's written American ports close to immigrants from cholera stricken countries. This is Europe. Uh, and, and here you can see how thin the line can be between uh, this image of uh, a poor immigrant. We have now also refugees from Ukraine 
Um, and uh, how thin is the line between one that can be a carrier of a disease and this whole concept of uh, a being a disease carrier uh, actually was the discovered around these uh, years, uh, including uh, um, the famous story about Typhoid Mary, if you remember. Uh, she was an Irish cook uh, that was uh, carrying uh, Salmonella tiffy and infected uh, uh, several occasions and even people died because of it. And uh, when there was an epidemiological investigation, uh, they asked her to be in isolation and uh, every time she finally got back to her uh, position, it was very hard for her to understand this whole concept of uh, um, someone who is, uh, seems to be healthy, but uh, uh, she was a carrier of Salmonella tiffy in the gallbladder. Uh, and finally, after she refused several times and continued to, to infecting people, she was taken in isolation for more than two decades. Um, so all this issue about causation, uh, it's not just a scientific question, it's also very practical. Uh, and uh, also during COVID, we had the question about isolation and the question about uh, humans that are carrying the disease. And again, how thin is the line between having a person who is a carrier and thinking about someone as the disease itself. And this is the, the anti-Semitic caricature, of course, of uh, a, the Jew from the East, the Ostjuden, uh, dirty, primitive. Uh, in the pre-Israeli era, the main uh, kind of uh, public health uh, campaigns were among uh, Jews from the East. Uh, again, the Ostjuden, as they were, uh, described uh, mainly you had the uh, Jews from uh, Germany, uh, UK, France, uh, with uh, several societies such as Oze and Toz, the Society for Ju Preservation of Jewish Health. Um, I have several, many, many posters and, and also uh, movies about how they needed to educate uh, the Jews from, from the East. Later on, after the establishment of Israel, you have the consolidation of the Ashkenazi Jew coming uh, both from the East and the West. Uh, I guess that some uh, of the Jews from Germany are not sleeping well in their graves when they understood, if they understood that uh, they are lumped together uh, with uh, Jews from Poland. My family came from uh, Poland, uh, by the way. Uh, they were lumped together as Ashkenazi Jews and the new uh, Jews that were needed to be so-called educated were those coming from Arab countries, the Sephardic or Mizrahi. Uh, so it's a very interesting concept uh, how race uh, and racism can be related to public health and how uh, flexible can be the issue of uh, race. Uh, during COVID, I was also astonished to see uh, how sometimes uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews were uh, called ticking bombs. I think that uh, looking on uh, human beings as ticking bombs, it's a kind of dehumanization. Um, and um, it's, I think, very relevant to our discussion today about causation and what should be the frame, framing of uh, public health in this instance. Uh, is public health about uh, exclusion, about creating walls and uh, doing quarantine, isolation, mainly to protect ourselves from others, whoever others can be, immigrants, poor people, etc. Or is public health really about inclusion, not exclusion? And is it about uh, human rights? And I think these uh, two tendencies are uh, always there uh, throughout uh, uh, history. Uh, and I think that many times public health, unfortunately, is mainly being understood uh, within the, a very militaristic uh, kind of approach. I myself served as a physician in the military, in, in the IDF. I was trained as a public health physician uh, in the Army Health Branch. Um, many of us uh, tend to be uh, key figures in the public health system, and including COVID-19 uh, response. But uh, although I was trained in the military, I think that uh, Many times, unfortunately, in Israel and other countries, it's very easy, so-called, uh, to give responsibility to the military because we are not investing enough in the civilian uh, sector. Um, so it seems that I'm bringing different notions, but I think it's very important to start with these kind of values when we're talking about public health research and practice. And here, for example, you see the role of the military. And again, you cannot uh, 
think about uh, public health uh, research and vaccination, by the way, without a, a, a learning the role, the historical uh, aspects of uh, a public health research in the military, also among soldiers, among prisoners, um, but also lots of important advancements that were made. Uh, and you can see here, for example, quarantine uh, on the border between uh, uh, Switzerland and Italy. Uh, you can see here the US public health services that until today are wearing uh, uniforms and many uh, different measures such as fumigation, uh, use of DDT, uh, they tend to be many times very humiliating for some people including here in Israel uh, in the 50s. Um, and you can see here the Canadian field hygiene section, the Lausing liberated Russian prisoners of war. Um, and you have similar pictures also in the Israeli history. And that's something uh, important uh, to remember. Many that were fumigated uh, don't, or the Laos not even remember it, but for many it was a very traumatic uh, uh, event. Um, there is a museum of history of medicine that I really urge you to go and see uh, across the, 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 the road uh, where the Faculty of Health Sciences, uh, the Israeli history of public health, it's on the third floor. And you, if you have the time, I really urge you to go uh, uh, there and see. I myself studied quite a lot uh, the history of uh, ringworm irradiation, a uh, practice that was quite um, um, common up until uh, the late 50s, uh, including about 100,000 uh, uh, immigrants uh, came to Israel, most of them from our countries. Um, many of them later uh, suffered from different uh, ailments, including uh, head and neck cancer. And here also the question of causation uh, became very important. Uh, there were studies, uh, cohorts uh, that were followed and in the 70s, um, uh, the Lancet published a, a paper, uh, an article about uh, head and neck cancer, higher risk among those uh, irradiated. And of course, uh, it's uh, very anachronistic to claim that in the 50s when they were doing it, they knew about it. Uh, but I'm talking not just about cancer, there were children taking from the parents. Uh, these kind of measures were, by the way, mainly initiated uh, by the Zionist uh, and other organizations, a Jewish organization uh, uh, in Eastern Europe uh, at the beginning. And that's something that is really interesting and I can share with you public, uh, several studies that I wrote about them. Uh, until today, the compensation law that was enacted in 94, it's very interesting to understand uh, what is the causation um, that is uh, there. Uh, and in general, when you have uh, legal uh, trials, uh, trying to connect uh, exposure, different exposures can be uh, infectious diseases, it can be environmental uh, Ill, uh, exposures to a certain uh, outcome like cancer. That's something that is very, very uh, hard sometimes to, to define. So Professor Collins, you mentioned uh, physics. Uh, and other, uh, there were other papers uh, talking about psychology. Uh, within epidemiology and public health, many times you have multiple causations, and then it's very, very hard uh, to understand exactly um, not only what is the biological and scientific causation, but how we can interpret it also to legal causation if you want to compensate maybe people that were uh, exposed. So Suna will present you the Bradford Hill criteria uh, that are uh, relevant, I think, for our discussion uh, uh, today, because some of the criteria is re reproducibility. Uh, so it's interesting from a different uh, a point, uh, a point of view, and of course, uh, also the role of statistics um, that was mentioned today uh, several times, uh, and of course, uh, many times also the 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 the. Um, finally, it's a human decision, uh, you know, to say. You know, do we need the p-value below 0 0.05 or do we want a, a 0 0.01 or maybe in a legal context, a, a just 51% uh, probability is enough. Uh, and that's something that is very interesting. And I think it's going back to some of what Professor Collins discussed. Uh, um, I, I would like also to present the question of uh, what is called sometimes a social epidemiology how uh, maybe uh, reaching into consensus uh, is uh, maybe much more important uh, 
uh, issue. And of course, this uh, means that you need to, uh, to be transparent uh, and create uh, rules uh, for decision uh, making. And uh, maybe evidence-based medicine are not such good rules because they're too narrow. Uh, so today I would like to, to talk, for example, about evidence-informed uh, decision making. That's something uh, that we are uh, doing uh, an analysis. Uh, we established a new center at Ben Gurion University of uh, Implementation Science and Policy Engagement uh, Center with Professor Maury Island. We're going to have uh, an international uh, um, seminar in on the 9th and 10th of May. You are all invited. Uh, I'll give you later uh, the details. Uh, and it's uh, also about uh, creating a, a consensus. So the question of uh, irreproducibility or reproducibility, of course, it's also related to the question of uh, uh, how you create a consensus and how you make, uh, uh, how you're doing the decision making. In my case, I'm very interested also from the move from science to policy, policy making. And you cannot, uh, uh, um, of course, uh, discuss uh, today the question of uh, policy making without understanding uh, the, the sociological context. Uh, so many of us, uh, and here on the left uh, uh, below, you can see I was compared to uh, Dr. Mengele, not only myself, many other of my colleagues. Uh, it's here written in Hebrew that I have so much blood on my hands that with the vaccination we killed more uh, than in any Israeli war and the uh, uh, road accidents. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Sharon Al Roy Price, the head of the Israeli Public Health Services, is now uh, together with uh, uh, protection because uh, there were so many threats uh, on, on her. Uh, so how you can create a consensus and decision-making and reproducibility when you have such a context, such a heated uh, context of anti-vaxxers. Now, this is not new. Uh, here, this is a caricature from uh, 1916. Uh, 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 it's uh, from uh, Life magazine. Uh, and you can see uh, these are anti-vaxxers at, at that time uh, that are... Um, very angry with uh, what they perceive as the medicalization of schools and uh, another discussion that is very uh, common today. So you see for them, the public school was turned into a public clinic. Physical examination were made uh, by Rockefeller Foundation, public health service, health officer, keeper of the pound. Uh, it's also about uh, what they described as being uh, cruel to animals. So it's an anti-vivisectionist uh, uh, context. And of course, I'm very, very supportive of vaccination. But we need to remember that vaccination, although they are great, there were lots of criticism. Some of the criticism actually improved vaccination, like uh, with the move from pertussis to acerola pertussis, um, and also uh, medicalizing uh, issues such as uh, public health, uh, obesity, and others. Uh, that's something that we need to remember that public health, we have lots of power, but we need to be very careful. And this was true also when we enacted the lockdowns, and that's something that we need to uh, also to remember. So I'm very proud of being a public health physician, but I think that sometimes we uh, tend to forget that uh, creating consensus and being transparent about science, that's something that is very important in order to create uh, trust. And of course, trust must be made also remembering that vaccinations cannot solve all of our problems. Uh, if uh, there are communities <coughs> in Israel, for example, without access to a, a water, like in some unrecognized Bedouin villages, uh, I think it's uh, easy to understand why uh, they are suspicious about uh, some public health measures, um, maybe because of uh, fake news, of course, but also because they're asking, you know, uh, why you're just uh, remembering us uh, uh, with vaccination, why not before? Um, are you afraid of being infected from us? And it re it's going back to the question of uh, what is exactly the role of public health, exclusion or inclusion? So public health is much broader than uh, uh, medical aspects. So if physicians are usually stuck here on the, you know, uh, 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 genetics, uh, age, sex, of course, very important factor, and individual lifestyle factors. In public health, we take also the community context, living and working conditions, and you see that healthcare services are just probably uh, influencing about 20% of our health. Of course, it's much more complicated than the interactions. But uh, we cannot forget the socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions. I'm very involved now with climate change and health, and also with the uh, health inequities as was presented uh, in my uh, research. So 
I think that uh, uh, if we talk about reproducibility and irreproducibility, uh, we have here Bradford Hill causality criteria that were developed uh, mainly uh, during and after World War II, uh, where uh, let's say modern epidemiology was developed uh, with uh, you know discoveries such as uh, uh, the risk of uh, smoking, something that was very very uh, controversial. Um, you know that in the 30s and 40s, the physicians were sometimes advertising uh, cigarettes. Um, there, are, there were other uh, achievements uh, uh, in development of epidemiological methodology with observational studies, uh, case control studies, cohort studies, uh, clinical epidemiology. And you can see here, and I'm not going to go all over this uh, uh, table, uh, the only necessary uh, uh, criteria is temporality, right? You cannot claim causality when uh, uh, something not preceding uh, right uh, uh, the outcome. Uh, but you, you can see here strength of association, consistency, okay? Consistency is about repeating uh, the same results. Um, specificity, uh, the gradient, plausibility, there should be a biological mechanism, a coherence, okay? So again, this is about reproducibility, a experiment, Okay, so if there are also experimental studies, not just uh, observational studies, and also analogy, or except from temporality, all the other criteria uh, are not necessary, but are just uh, giving more. Uh, but in many ways, like David Hume said, uh, you know, um, finally, finally, even if there is temporality in all others, uh, causation is something that is very, very, a problematic uh, uh, to prove, of course, but the Bradford Hill criteria is something that we are teaching and students are, uh, are being asked on that. Um, many times I'm using a, a multiple choice questions, uh, but of course this is very, very, uh, we don't have now the time, but it's very uh, important in discussion. Okay, and uh, the, the next level was to move, especially in the next two decades, after evidence-based medicine was developed, uh, the term was uh, first mentioned in, uh, I think in 1992 by a series of articles on JAMA. Uh, the whole perception was developed uh, some decades uh, before with clinical epidemiology, but you can see that uh, evidence-based medicine man many times it's too narrow. And uh, we want to bring evidence in from decision-making by understanding that uh, it's not just about scientific evidence. If I'm thinking that I'm going to the parliament, convincing the parliament to invest in public health measures, including vaccines, uh, I'm doing now vaccines uh, uh, for brucellosis. Uh, we have a, a, a meeting tomorrow. Um, it's not enough to bring just scientific evidence uh, from the context of uh, convincing decision-making. Uh, we need to uh, understand the political context. We need to understand what are the resources available. We need to understand, yes, that we need to do lobbying uh, but there are be, going to be lobbyists from the other side. And also understanding of course community needs. So that's something that uh, it must be taken into consideration. And that's something we are teaching our a, a public health uh, residents. Uh, okay, and here you can see, again, if uh, we start from uh, the below, drivers for evidence in from practice. Okay, and we want to have a clinical thinker uh, that is uh, critical, sorry, and the health professional that is critical. Okay, so we want to understand uh, the role of uh, evaluation and the uh, research awareness, application of knowledge, professional accountability. All of that, all of this must be taken also into consideration. And I think it's relevant for our discussion uh, today, but it's bringing uh, not just the philosophical or epistemological context, it's also the sociological and the policy. Uh, and I know that for some, uh, this will maybe seem a bit dirty, but uh, you know, for a public health practitioner that want to promote public health, you must take it into consideration. And uh, maybe to finalize, uh, um, I think my time is uh, almost over. Um, I think uh, that uh, this means also that we need to have a, a there is a clinical bioethics that uh, was developed mainly uh, after the Holocaust and the Second World War. Uh, it was mainly very individualistic with American influence. 
uh, the role of autonomy was very important and I think it's still important, but from when you deal with public health, and this is from Nancy Cass, an article published in the American Journal of Public Health, I think 2001 or 2002, just before they published the Code of Ethics, uh, you can see that uh, there is a framework of ethics analysis here specifically for public health is needed because we start from a morally relevant different uh, values uh, that define clinical practice and research. Now, I don't think that these are contradictory. I think they are complementary, but I think that many times there are uh, some uh, uh, tensions. Um, and uh, I have uh, other slides. I will send it to you. Uh, I see that my time is running, but just to summarize, and you know, maybe I'll, I'll skip to the next, to the last uh, slide. Um, um, you know, if you want to speak about uh, causation, for example, in public health and to ask how pandemics end and see, this is from Gina Colata, the New York correspondent, New York Times correspondent already in May, May 2020. Uh, and uh, there are two quotes from my close friends. Alan Brand was one of my PhD advisor and uh, Dora Varga, historian of medicine from Exeter. And you can see an end can occur not because the disease has been vanquished, but because people grow tired of panic mode and learn to live with the disease. Many questions about the so-called end are determined not by medical and public health data, but by socio-political processes. Now, I'm not trying to diminish the role of epidemiology. I'm myself an epidemiologist, but I think that we need to be very humble. And I think all scientists need to be humble and understand that uh, the question of knowledge and who's producing knowledge and how knowledge, this knowledge should be finally uh, being uh, adapted and used uh, is a much broader uh, uh, question. Uh, Adora Varga saying endings are very, very messy. Look back, we have a weak narrative for whom does epidemic end and who gets to say. And uh, I again want to go back to the first slide I show you with the uh, uh, cholera. Uh, I think that we need to start from our values and ask at least in public health, what is the role of public health? What is the relevant uh, science there? How we can define causation, but finally, how this uh, finally should uh, inform our uh, decision uh, uh, making. You saw that reproducibility is part of uh, the Bradford Hill uh, criteria, but I think that uh, uh, defining uh, what is something that reproducible, especially in the age of uh, so much rapid uh, pace of publication and open access, uh, that's something that they need to have a very thorough discussion also about the uh, interest, uh, who is publishing the audience, and what are the interests uh, of those doing uh, the research, uh, public money versus private money and health inequities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have uh, the time just for uh, one or two very short uh, questions. If someone has that. Maybe or in the Zoom, uh, among the Zoom uh, participants, if someone has a question. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, okay, Professor Collins, I want to ask you yes, later a question. <laughs> yes, so please, uh, uh, Professor Collins. You are mute. So I haven't got a question. I just wanted to make a statement. I, I don't think scientists want to be too humble. I mean, I, I think life has got much more complicated since 2016. Uh, you remember there was a new uh, president elected in the United States who did things that none of us thought was possible since the 1930s. And um, I think if we want to save democracy, pluralist democracy, as I call it, I think we need to maintain our respect for science. Now, all the criticism of science over the years, including this reproducibility problem and so on and so forth, has uh, reduced confidence in science. And we've got to find ways of getting it back. And I don't think the right way to get it back is to be humble. I think the right way to get it back, is, it, it, to some extent, it was indicated by the last two chemistry talks. You know, one of the reasons that people need to respect science as an institution is because its bottom line is the truth and therefore honesty and integrity. So as a kind of philosopher, philosophically inclined sociologist, um, 
like other philosophers of science, are troubled by the demarcation problem. What's different about science? And it, 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 the demarcation problem can no longer be solved by Karl Popper and, <coughs> other, and some of the other formal formulas that people were putting forward in the 1950s. But I do think it can be solved by saying science is craft work with integrity. And you keep stressing the integrity. It's different to nearly every other institution because ne nearly every other institution in modern Western societies doesn't have the same kind of commitment to integrity. And I think that's some one point at which scientists shouldn't be too humble. We need to be able to say, scientists need to be able to say, that is to say, epidemiologists need to be able to say, we know more about the power of vaccines than ordinary people because we look at it from an institution which is committed to the truth. Well, I agree, but I think uh, we need to be very, very careful and balanced here uh, to see, and, and here I think the role of history is important. I think that uh, throughout history we saw that uh, what you said, that again, I agree, that's something that we need to earn. It's not uh, self-evident. Or I, there is something inherent also in science, uh, the competition, uh, sometimes maybe being uh, detached too much from society and elitistic, that can create some hybris that uh, can lead you to very, very horrible things. Uh, I take it to the extreme. Uh, you know, German medicine just before the Second World War, th this was the, the, the best uh, the best science. And sometimes being too detached and being afraid of uh, dealing with uh, getting into consensus and, and you know and, and understanding the, the, the context really can bring you into very dangerous uh, positions. Uh, so I think, yes, uh, there is um, both, I'm talking now both about scientists and about physicians, okay? It's not necessarily the same. There is some overlap, <coughs> but not all physicians necessarily should be, you know, amazing scientists. And some of them are very bad scientists or think, or think maybe the uh, excellent scientists. Uh, I think we need to be humble in, in a sense, uh, um, maybe also towards other scientists, other disciplines, and understanding that maybe... When I talk about causation in epidemiology, it might be quite different than the physicists talking about causation or psychologists. Uh, and here, I don't want to go to relativism, uh, of course. So here, and the, this is a very long uh, discussion, uh, probably not now. Um, uh, I became, uh, uh, I'm now, I used to be uh, very much, um, I'm talking maybe almost now three decades ago within epistemological and uh, positive logitivism and all of these demarcation questions. Uh, I became a bit, uh, I, I felt that it's a bit sterile and not leading me anywhere. Uh, but I, I heard and learned a bit uh, from my colleagues, especially at Barilan University, uh, that they, there is a science, technology and society program, uh, discussions about social epi epistemology. And, and uh, in some ways that are not so easy to find the right balance between not becoming a relativist, but on the other hand, uh, being, yes, a little bit humble about uh, how science progress and being critical uh, and not falling into uh, this kind of uh, being authoritarian and uh, um, not self-reflective. Because maybe another important part of science is, is uh, being have developing a critical state of mind in, in a good way, um, I think. Not necessarily like Popper, but uh, um, understanding the, the, the progress and, and the, yeah, casting doubt uh, and checking ourselves, uh, but also being aware that there is a political context. I think uh, uh, it's important, but uh, I don't think there is a one solution. I understand your point about Trump. Um, so you cannot be too humble, I agree, 
but not being also too, you know, naive about, uh, you know, being uh, being a scientist and understanding a role. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm uh, sorry that we have to stop here because we are running okay. late. Thank you again very much.